panel, the title of which is Disrupting Incarceration's Disruptive Cycle. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Um, today we're going to talk about the prison systems in the United States, Italy, Greece, but I have a question to get started. How many of you have ever been in a prison? Oh, more than I thought. Okay, so it's a self-selecting audience. So those of you who have been in prison, who work in prison, understand that there are problems within the systems and there are stereotypes within the systems. What we're trying to do today or hope to do today is break down some of those stereotypes, talk about disrupting the criminal justice system and talk about the varied work that each of us are doing with inmates, with former inmates, to, and with the families of incarcerated to try and break down those stereotypes and to try and break down, to some degree, the walls that exist between those who are inside and those who are outside. I'd now like to turn it over to our first panelist, Anthony Cardinales. Anthony? Hello, everyone. I'm Anthony Cardinales. Um, I'm a former BPI uh, student and a BPI alumni, that's Bard Prison Initiative. I earned my bachelor's in prison and I spent 19 years of my life behind bars. What I would hope to do with this panel is shed light on the human element of what people categorize as the prisoner and they use statistics to define a person without truly acknowledging what that person is made of. So in any way that I possibly can, I would like to demonstrate how I'm a sum total of all of my experiences and I at one time or another was one statistic or another but neither one of them or any of them define me. I'm a sum total of all of my experiences and we just hope to bring that to light. Which is what we all are, right? A sum total of all of our life experiences. Absolutely. Peter, I'm going to turn it over to you, Peter Goldberg from the Brooklyn Bail Fund. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to speak very quickly about uh, bail and what we do in the Brooklyn Community Bail Fund. And I think I'd also like to challenge the folks here to think about if uh, disrupting the criminal justice system is enough or if you actually have to dismantle the system entirely and completely reimagine how we deal with harm, how we deal with accountability, um, I'd also like to do a show of hands. Um, how many people here have actually been, uh, when they were in prison, sentenced? Um, okay, or how many people in this room, for a show of hands, have uh, had a loved one, let's say, shot? Okay, so this is a very different room, um, and I think that's important to call out, because if you uh, go to East New York, or if you go to Brownsville, or uh, predominantly low-income neighborhoods, uh, predominantly neighborhoods uh, populated by people of color, this, this question is very different. So this is a problem, this is a tragedy of mass incarceration in the United States that affects sp specific people in specific ways. Um, I'd say very quickly, the issue we deal with is bail. Uh, which is quite different in the U.S. than it is uh, anywhere else in the world, right? So the idea of bail is you pay some money to ensure return. It's supposed to let people out. And in fact, what it does is it uh, imprisons millions of Americans every year because they cannot afford to buy their own freedom, right? And this is what we do in Brooklyn is we pay to get people out who are accused of misdemeanors, and that is disruptive, um, but it will never be the solution, 
to this problem, right? So I would challenge all of us to think about if there's any way to actually disrupt a system that is, to be frank, in our country, uh, quite purposeful and rooted in white supremacy. Um, so I hope we can get into that. I'm getting and looks that... Peter, should... you've made a really good point. Are we talking about disruption? Are we talking about dismantling? Are we talking about a combination of both? I mean, there aren't solutions to these problems, but what we'd love to do is open our minds to possible changes. And we also really want to hear from you. So as you think of questions, please send them in, because we'd like this to be a back and forth dialogue between you and us rather than just us. I'm now going to turn it over to Max Kenner from the Bard Prison Initiative. Max? Thank you. And Thanks, Stelios and everybody for having us here. Uh, before getting into what we do at the Bard Prison Initiative, I want to acknowledge a conversation we were having um, earlier today about the difficulty in talking about our work in an international context. Because the truth of the matter is that the United States has distinguished itself in such a way uh, that is extraordinary by any historical or quantitative measure in the scale of its investment in criminal punishment over the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, Peter referred to what uh, this phrase that is now common in the United States, it hasn't always existed, it's rel relatively new, but this phenomenon we now call mass incarceration, which is essentially a longer than generation uh, long investment in punishment over every other component of the safety net education, healthcare, housing in the United States that began more or less in the early 1970s, 1971, 1972, depending how you measure it. And what it means is that over this period of time, my whole lifetime, in the United States, we've incarcerated more and more people for longer and longer periods of time, often for smaller infractions of the law. And as we have done that, we've done something especially curious, which is as prisons have become a central part of the landscape of public institutions in American life, been perhaps become some of perhaps the most important public institutions in American life, as we've done that, and as more and more people have gone to them, we've gone out of our way to make them worse. And Max, right. I'm going to interrupt because those are some really good points that I want to get back to. I'd like to have everybody introduce themselves and speak a little bit, and then we'll come back and, and pick this back up. So Erica Mateo, who is also a graduate of the Bard Prison Initiative. Erica? Hello. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Erica Mateo, and I was born and raised in Brownsville, Brooklyn, so one of the places that uh, Peter spoke about earlier. Um, I was incarcerated at the age of 15. I did six years in prison for a violent crime. Um, I was incarcerated in a juvenile system as well as the adult system um, during my sentence. And I am an alumni of the Bar Prison Initiative. I also now work um, mostly community organizing and public housing for the Center for Court Innovations. Um, and I'm happy to have this conversation. Good. Well, we're thrilled everybody is here. Thank you. Fotini Milioni is our next speaker who works here in Greece. Fotini. Um, I'm working for um, many years for um, prisoners and uh, ex-prisoners. Now I'm working with ex-prisoners. And uh, for me and uh, for my point of view is... Um, um, maybe to discuss how, how open is the society uh, to the problems and the stereotypes of ex-prisoners and how the society can uh, uh, receive uh, the, um, uh, people back uh, from prisons and uh, what, what means the stigma of uh, prisoners and uh, ex-prisoners if uh, they are back to uh, the society, and this is a, a, a very, a very difficult procedure, especially for um, a Greece and a Greek society that is a very close society. Thank you. 
And Leah Sacerdote is going to be our next speaker, but we want to show a one-minute video prior to Leah's speaking about the work that she does with families of the incarcerated, specifically children. I'm going to end up in prison too, just because my dad's there. You're wrong if you think there are other possibilities for me. I know a criminal beats a criminal. It's not true there's good in everyone. My dad's a bad person. Don't think that it could be different for me. That's where I'm going. Doing well at school, finding a good job, that's not important to me. Being in a gang, getting into fights is what matters. Listening to me, you should just write me off. And don't ever believe I want to succeed. I've dropped out. I'm out of reach. Don't assume that I can become anything. You see, the script of my life has already been written. Don't dare to say there's still hope for me. If things were done differently, there could be potential. It's over. Unless you reverse your thinking, totally turn around how you see me. And don't believe it's over. There could be potential if things were done differently. There's still hope for me. Don't dare to say the script of my life has already been written. You see, I can become anything. Don't assume that I've dropped out. I'm out of reach. I want to succeed. And don't ever believe you should just write me off. Listening to me is what matters. Getting into fights, being in a gang, that's not important to me. Finding a good job, doing well at school, that's where I'm going. It could be different for me. Don't think that my dad's a bad person. There's good in everyone. It's not true a criminal beats a criminal. I know there are other possibilities for me. You're wrong if you think just because my dad's there, I'm going to end up in prison too. Well, you described it, but you're right, wow. You're absolutely right, turning a paradigm on its head. So Leah Sacerdote and Eduardo, who is one of our, her, her colleagues, will speak next. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you to be uh, with you. Uh, this video shows us not only the focus of Bambini Senza Sbarre, the association I represent here, an Italian association in, uh, that work in a network, European network, uh, the, uh, but this video shows the disruption um, we want to provoke in these children and uh, we hope uh, not only in prison but also in the whole society. Thank you. Because, oh, okay. I just want to say, bambini senza sbarre, children without bars, any kind of bars, any kind of children. Good. So we have a lot of different concepts on the table. I've made a couple of notes. Eric, I'm going to turn to you first because you mentioned that you were in the juvenile justice system. Presumably it didn't work. You ended up in the adult justice system. Could you talk about... I think we're, pri we're primarily talking about prisons for adults. Could you talk about how you think the juvenile justice system in the U.S., in New York to be particular, might be changed so that there isn't the continuity that that video referred to? Um, I'm sorry, I wasn't prepared for that question. Um, the juvenile justice system in... Um, in America works much like um, like the adult system because um, foundationally what we the conversation about prison and who should be in prison and how we treat prisoners um, is the same across the board so in the juvenile prison um, it is a, it is a place where uh, many young people are still developing and trying to find themselves um, in a place that is not conducive for their development. Um, and so finding more ways uh, for therapeutic um, and educational services as well in the juvenile system is just as important um, as it is in others. 
Good. That's a good point. Thank you. Peter and I were speaking a little bit beforehand about how do we break the cycle. I think that's all of what all of us are trying to do. But you were talking about what you do. You put up bail so that people aren't locked up because they can't pay. And you're talking about the populations of people, at least in the U.S., that are most affected by that. Um, what would be your alternative to the bail system, Peter, if there were a magic wand here today and we said you can get what you want? We would completely abolish it. Um, just to, to Erica's point, where, where I grew up, which is a, a very affluent white neighborhood in New York City, I went to private schools, there was no juvenile justice system. That doesn't mean there wasn't people breaking the law. That doesn't mean there wasn't harm being done. We just didn't deal with it by putting children in, in cages, right? So I think, again, it's in terms of what you replace the juvenile justice system with, you replace it with care and support and understanding for children. Um, and I want to call out that in New York, until this past year, we charged 15-year-olds, 16-year-olds as adults. We still will charge for certain crimes 13-year-olds as adults. Uh, a 13-year-old is not an adult, no matter where you are. For us, for bail, um, you know, we pay so people can be home with their families. Bail is supposed to be about getting people back. Our clients, we've paid for 3,000 people to date. 95% of them have made all their court dates. When they miss a court date, it's often because uh, they are dealing with uh, multiple jobs. They're the sole caretaker for their children. Um, and I'd also like to say that in terms of replacing it, something that we can simply do is bring drastically fewer people into the system to begin with. Excellent points. Um, I want to talk a little bit about reentry, which is your work, I believe, as you do that with people once once they've been released from prison. I mean, the recidivism rate in the United States is it's a revolving door. People get out, and something like sixty percent, in general, get rearrested. How how do you work with that in Greece, and what would be your suggestions for making reentry more positive and more successful? Um. It is very difficult to, to be back to the society. It is a very difficult procedure because um, um, there is a, a, a very big gap be between prison and society. And uh, you have to make uh, um, a lot of um, steps just to, to break your, uh, this gap. And um, our institution that I'm working for, it is named Epanodos. Uh, it tries to to, uh, to make uh, more um, uh, these steps um, and to bridge this gap between prison and society, especially offering a counsel counseling to prisoners and to ex-prisoners, just to know what is. Um, uh, after release, how is the society now? Because uh, somebody um, could be in prison two or three years before, and now the society and the things are um, different from two or three years. So we can uh, uh, we can give him the information about how the society is now, its present now and uh, by counseling, by offering uh, them the information about uh, what is going now, uh, by giving them um, uh, um, lessons, um, art lessons or other lessons, uh, just to have the possibilities to be in the, in the, in the present conditions. Thank you. I'd now like to read some of the questions from the audience, and, and one, again, Peter and I, who had the luxury of having a couple of conversations prior to today, talked about this. So an audience question is, what alternatives to incarceration do you envision that will preserve the dignity of those who don't follow the rules and live by the laws of a civil society? 
So if people break the rules in a civil society, we have rules, what alternative to incarceration is there? Anybody want to take that in particular? Sorry. Leah? Yes. yes, I would say something about uh, it. in Italy, it's, uh, it's possible if judges give, uh, give um, alternative measures and uh, home detention. If uh, offense is not so severe, and this is uh, important for uh, parents, per, for example, who can stay at home with their children. And um, the minor... Um, did, did you, let, uh, see, just to answer precisely, uh, yes, Italy is oriented, the judi jurisdictional system is oriented slowly, to have always alternate, something alternative than prison, always, every time. Of course, now is still for minors until 18 years old. It's already like that. Alternative my, um, uh, sentences. That means the, the, the guy or the girl doesn't get in prison, have some, some social work to do, and he lives at home without any other restriction. The same thing, alternative measures are thought, and two-thirds about of uh, prisoners in Italy don't get in prison. Even if they are offenders, they don't get in prison. That's interesting. Boy, complete opposite in the US. Uh, Max, you want to talk a little bit about the role of education inside prison, outside prison, but because this is a panel on prison, let's talk about the role of education college education in prison? Sure, I, I think that it's important for us to understand prisons in the United States or across the West um, as public institutions among a landscape of many others, right? So we work very hard to eschew the language of recidivism or the revolving door or transforming people or what have you, precisely because we worry that in criminal justice reform, there is perhaps too often an effort to make things a little less bad rather than actually making them better, right? So what we found uh, at the Bard Prison Initiative over the last 20 years is we provide a full college liberal arts education in prisons across the state of New York. We enroll 300 students full-time at Bard College. Bard College is a private college in New York. We think very highly of ourselves. You know, we take students from, sounds like the high schools like where Peter went, and from Chicago, New York, LA, Europe, Asia, you know, Asia, best, you know, fantastic students. But the incarcerated students are among the best students we have at the college. They major in uh, courses of study that include mathematics and natural, natural sciences, computer science, the art, uh, going to graduate schools, uh, BPI alum who've been released from prison, complete graduate degrees in the Ivy Leagues now every year. Uh, and like Erica and like Anthony, you know, they work in management of extraordinary businesses and not-for-profits and in government. So the point is that when we think of what to do with the criminal justice system, we should resist the urge to tinker around the edges and we should acknowledge the capacity and ambition uh, and potential of the people within them. The truth is that our failures in, in the United States, and I think this is across the West, is not just in how we punish people, but you know, in law enforcement, but also it's the crisis of confidence in the academy. Among people who run our most prestigious colleges, universities, their sense that what we offer, a commitment to the arts, commitment to the sciences, is somehow only relevant to certain kinds of people and certain kinds of young people. That's, that's, a, that's a very good point. Um, I, and it's interesting when you say that Bard graduates are some of the best students you have and some of the, gra the best graduates and most successful. When I first started Puppies Behind Bars, we put eight-week-old puppies, Labrador Retriever puppies, into prison, and they live there for two to three years in the cells with the inmates, and the inmates are fully responsible for all of the care of the dogs. But when I first started, I was told, 
Inmates are going to abuse the dogs. They can't possibly follow through with the restrictions and the goals. And they're the best dog trainers, I mean, bar none. And what I found, and part of why I love working in prison, is that there's such, in that environment, I'm going to turn it to you, Anthony, so this is a, a forewarning. Um, in that environment, there's such a hunger for knowledge. There's such a hunger to go beyond the day-to-day -day environment. At least that's what I find in Puppies Behind Bars, that I feel like the people with whom I work are sponges for gathering up information and putting that to work, in, in our case, to contribute to society because they're raising a dog that will then go to a wounded war veteran and we just started donating our dogs to police officers who have post-traumatic stress from the line of duty. So these are inmates who are nurturing, living with animals for two to three years, giving them up, knowing they're gonna give it up to somebody else. So there's an ability to contribute to society while they're incarcerated. But could you talk a little bit about your experience in prison, not the nitty gritty, but did a college, how did the college education fit into, as you said, your composite of many, many, many different experiences? What was the prison college program experience like for you? Uh, the college for me was a, a way in which to start to articulate the transformation that I was undergoing and to truly acknowledge how this human evolution really works. So, so many people are quick to judge so many people are quick to judge a person who makes a mistake. And what I uh, would really like everyone to consider at one point of their life or the other is, if you took the worst mistake or worst decision you made in your life, which is a split second decision, would you want to be defined by that for the rest of your life? Most people say no, and they shouldn't be. Yes, you should acknowledge that mistake or bad decision. You should, uh, handle and accept the consequences of those decisions. So the college experience started to help me get those thoughts and be able to articulate them and then apply that knowledge in real world atmosphere, which we don't have that opportunity to compete because we do have that stigma, that ex-prisoner, that violent offender, that other category. And we have this boogeyman that makes this re-entry very difficult because we're not afforded opportunities like everyone else. And so most prisoners know that, acknowledge that, and so we know that we have to do the above and beyond just to compete on what others are com considering a level playing field. That's a good point, thank you. Um, in the U.S., and I don't know if this exists in Greece and Italy, I sure as hell hope it doesn't, but in the U.S. we have privatized some of our prisons, which is taking horrendous and making it even more horrendous. Um, there are several questions on privatization of prisons in the U.S., so I don't know who wants to take that, if anybody wants to take that, if you have thoughts on it, if you've got experience with it. Anybody? I'm going to say, to say something for yes. Greece because it is very, um, it is very important because we, uh, now in, uh, in Greece we have only uh, public universities and uh, the law gives the prisoners the right to follow okay. some, uh, yes, um, um, to follow the public universities. And now we have in uh, prisons, uh, many prisoners that, um, uh, that are uh, students in um, these universities, and we have ex-prisoners that are um, now lawyers or um, mechanics, and uh, this is uh, very important for them because it is very easier to find a job or to be a member of the society. Can as, I? Uh, professionals, yes. Absolutely, please. Uh, Max and I were just talking about this before, and, and it goes to your point about tinkering. Um, the US spends $80 billion a year to cage and torture people. 40 billion of that goes to uh, around 30,000 private companies. So in terms of, you know, how do you disrupt a system? Well, how do you dismantle this and actually invest it in communities to actually 
appropriately address this crisis, right? And just to do some framing here, uh, we have 5% of the world's population and 20% of its incarcerated population. There are 2.3 million people in the US right now who are in prison or jail. There will be 11 million admissions to jail this year, right? Mostly because people can't afford bail. So I'm gonna play devil's advocate. And I'll let you, Max, let me, to, to let me play devil's advocate first and then you can say whatever you want. So devil's advocate, we're, we're believers. We work in prison, we believe that prison, the, the criminal justice system in our country should be changed. I think that's, but is there the political will? I mean, we've got a right-wing government in the U.S. right now. You just elected new right-wing government in Italy. You know, all these people are locked up. How come for all of these years? Why hasn't it changed? And is there then, even if there were the political will, is there the money to put behind it to say, okay, the elderly, all these other things that we can, health care, education, that the reformation of the political, of the prison system is going to be put on top. How realistic is that? And, I'll be super quick and then pass and then to Max, you. And then Leah and Eduardo want to say something. Um, if there's not the political will, then we need to create the political will. Um, the reason we have this huge growth of the people who are in, you can trace from slavery uh, to black codes, to reconstruction, to uh, the beginning of the civil rights. This has led to what uh, Max was talking about, which is a 500% uh, increase in the incarcerated population over the last 40 years, right? And again, I just wanna say like, how do we change it I don't know what the nicest area in Greece is, but we have abolition in the United States and it's called the Hamptons, right? And it's called Fifth Avenue. And this isn't my idea, this wonderful woman, Miriam Kaba has been talking about this for a while, but in terms of how do we make this possible, it exists, it is there. Just go to a really wealthy, really white neighborhood and you will find it. Yeah, I just think it's important to point out two things. Uh, the first is that the suggestion that reforming the system would cost money is a misnomer. There's nothing that we spend more money, more gratuitously on in the United States than incarceration, first of all. The second thing is, while you're right, we have a conservative government in the United States, it's also true that reforming criminal justice in one way or another, and obviously the details matter, is maybe the only issue in American political life that benefits from genuine uh, cross by transpartisan consensus. And um, this is true among uh, evangelical conservatives, fiscal conservatives, so we have an opportunity to do things better uh, in the United States. And you know, politics is, is in some way a problem. The greater problem is how much the, this, the decisions that matter, and Peter knows this better than anyone, happen so much at the local level. So you need political change, but you also need a real profound cultural transformation that's not gonna happen overnight. Thank you. And I just wanna point out that in terms of economics where we disagree, which is great, because we're eight different people, so we should have disagreements. If indeed we close prisons, and I'm talking about New York State, a lot of the communities in which prisons are located, that is the only job in town. So if you close prisons, what do you do with the officers, all these people who have well-paying jobs, and it's an economic driver. They're, what do you do with those people in terms of the economic cost of closing prisons? So I'm just putting it out there. We've got a, several really great questions. You want to say something? Uh, 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 yes. Um, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, I was trying to, to, to answer to the, sorry if I say that, to this uh, American prison industry. Sorry, if maybe it's not the right definition. But see, what we were just talking together now, what we think is very disruptive, and I would say uh, it's an hypothesis, it's just a, a mere dream, you know? But why don't you start, you, you, you Americans, why don't you start 
from the children. I tell you, I tell you one thing. We work with 100,000 children in Italy, about two million in Europe. These children are affected by imprisoned parents. Okay, what we do is just to uh, separate psychologically and emotionally from their parents. Just doing what? Exactly the contrary. Not separating them, but making them meet each other even once a week, two we uh, two, uh, twice a week, and so forth. Because this is the mechanism that makes children say, okay, you are my dad, you, you have been a criminal, I'm different. You saw the, the, the video at the very beginning. Doing this, we have, statistics says, that we have a drop of re-offending, re-offending, and inter intergenerational offending of uh, 80, 85%. This is the drop, the, what you call res recidivism, right. Right? okay? So, the leverage could be the children. Right. So children are not guilty. They are not guilty. And their parents are not only offenders, are human beings. Are offenders, okay, but human beings. Yes. They, they, they don't lose their being human beings. So start from the children. Whenever you say, of course, it's even politics, it's even politics. Whenever you say uh, 100,000 uh, uh, children, 1 million children, 2 million children, that's, that, that moves a lot, moves a lot. Many no. minds, you know, change their perspective. Very good point, thank you. That, uh, um, yeah. This is a kind, um, this is a matter of mind. It is not Would the policy because in, um, uh, in economic, um, uh, you know, um, awards, but it is a matter of mind. We have to change our minds just to change the system, really especially the, the, um, the correctional system, because this is a, a system that it is not high in the policy priority. Um, in Greece, we have only 35 prisons and about 9,500 uh, imprisonments. This is a very, a very small population. For, uh, for uh, politics. Unlike in our country, a huge population, which should be, I, we all think, higher up on the political agenda. A question for Erica and Anthony. It's inspiring to see Anthony and Erica turn their lives around and become productive and positive contributors to their communities. However, there's no discussion about justice for those who are the victims of criminal activity. Either or both of you want to take that? Yeah, one of the things that uh, I try to highlight in my uh, daily walks of life is that I can never assume that justice will be repaid to the person who experienced my behavior. And I'm not naive enough to say that that's going to be a reality. What I can say is that I have been given a sentence to serve as the consequence for that behavior. And so a byproduct of that is me changing my world, becoming a contributing member, and then trying to, as best I could, reduce the chances of anyone else that I know or am I affili affiliated with from committing these type of behaviors. So it's that uh, our ability to not just end when your sentence ends, but your work continues and it doesn't stop. So that is the way I contribute. That is me looking back on that family, on those people that were impacted and saying, this didn't happen in vain and we will try to make a change the best we could. But again, for me to define their justice would be naive. Thank you. I think to say that nobody talks about the rights of victims of violent crime in the United States is partially true and partially uh, absurd. Uh, it happens in an extraordinary way, uh, frequently, in all our political discussions about this, uh, but only in a particular context. Uh, and the context in which it does not happen is 
in facing the reality of the distinction between people who commit crimes and people who are victims of crime is actually illusory. If you go to a place like a maximum security prison, you're not going to find anyone who has not, in fact, in the past, this goes to Peter's point earlier about proximity to violence, who has not themselves been a victim of violent crime. Right? So we need to reorient our imaginations in thinking about how we can define an indi individual, as Anthony was saying, based on the worst thing they've ever done, as if that happens in a vacuum without a lived experience that precedes it. Thank and you. I, just so it'll take literally one second. In the United States, we do not ask survivors of crime at all what they want. Right? There are restorative justice programs uh, in New York and other places in the country right now that actually do that, and most survivors of crime do not feel safer or made whole by another individual going to prison. Right? So to this point about how do we deal with harm to people, a good first step would be to actually, to your point, understand that these are often the same people, and then to ask them, what do you need? And I'm going to disagree, but before I do, Erica, do you want to take the question which was to you and Anthony? Or if not, that's fine. Um, I think they did a, a really good job um, answering that question. From I think the way that the question was posed is, hey, you guys are doing a really good job. Uh, what about the victims? And I think that juxtaposition is, it just doesn't actually work, right? They, they don't really have a relationship to each other. Um, and so I think it's a tough question for me to answer, but I think these guys did a great job. Okay. And where I disagree, and, and I mentioned this the other night, that I primarily work with inmates who have been sentenced for homicide or murder, and they're serving very long sentences. And two of them that I referenced to you the other night, Peter, one is a male who has been in prison for 31 years. One is a female who's been in prison for 37 years. In New York, we've got what I think is a, a really bad system that you can go to the parole board every two years and the parole board looks at, and you guys can speak about it better if you want, looks at what you've done since you've been incarcerated, have you, do you accept responsibility for your crime, et cetera, et cetera. And in both of these two cases, they've been in puppies van bars for years, zero criminal record since they've been in prison. I mean, absolutely no problem. And every time they go before the parole board, there's a family victim impact statement, and the victims say, absolutely not should they go back to society. There's a phrase that's called, in, in New York at least, nature of crime. They keep getting hit, meaning they don't get released, because of the nature of their crime. The nature of the crime is never going to change. If you're in for murder, the person's dead, and you're not going to take that back. So the families who do get to keep, and these are just two individuals. I've got several other I could cite. These are families for whom having people who killed their loved ones locked up seems to me that it serves some purpose in their lives because they keep showing up every two years at the hearings. Peter? Yeah, we, I think... A major problem here is that we offer people no alternative. The system that we currently have that deals with harm solely focuses on retribution, right? So the restorative justice programs that I'm referring to actually offer family members to confront the person that uh, has harmed their loved one and actually allow for an actual process of of grief and then forgiveness. And I'm not saying everyone will necessarily want to do that, but from the, the programs we have in New York, for example, which deal with violent felonies, they do not deal with misdemeanors. The programs in New York that deal with this see a high number of individuals say, yes, that is what I want. I want to explain to this person what they did to me. I want to explain to them the harm that it's caused to our entire family. Um, so the reason that many people aren't interested in that is because they're actually, we don't offer it to most people. That's a good point, thank you. Here's a question for you. Um, in Greece, we have many immigrant teenagers in juvenile prison who have no family and nowhere to go. 
what welfare is in place for such cases in other countries? So do you want to talk first about Greece and then Leah Eduardo, if you can talk about, I assume that there are immigrant children, just like there are in the US, who are incarcerated in Italy. But you want to take that first, please? Um, uh, you mean that uh, if we have special measures for uh, juveniles and um, uh, for uh, female prisoners, we have um, different institutions and different measures. But I have to do to, to make a comment about the, the movement, the victims' movement, that is very strong uh, as, uh, even in Greece. And now we have uh, a special provisions uh, and um, a special um, law for victims and uh, rights victims that is very important. Um, now, uh, we also implement some restorative, um, a kind of restorative justice, just in these cases for uh, reconciliating uh, victims and, um, um, and um, um, uh, victims and prisoners. Okay. We implement uh, such a project in, uh, even in uh, prison, yes. Good. Thank you. Leah Eduardo, do you want to speak about she's immigrant a, children just, locked up in she, Italian prisons? Italy is prisons? like this. If you are a minor, uh, you don't have parents at all, uh, you offend, uh, they give you, the state give you, the judge gives you a tutor, a tutor from the civil society. There is a screening application for the tutors. So you have a, a kind of new parent you know, which is called tutor. And this project is going, is going to be spread all around Europe. Yes, for the minors without any kind of, no parents, no relatives, nobody, you know. We know the problem because we received migrants, right. you know, so right. with nobody at their, you know, just them alone. So can they get out of prison if there's no family to receive them? What happens if... Uh, you know, as soon as possible. The judge understands the situation, and we have a long list of tutors already, you know, vetted, because there must be a certain kind of persons, right. and, and it works. At the, very, at the very, I mean, if there is no other solution, unlikely they have a special, very soft uh, prisons. Okay, thank you. Here's Sorry a for the soft, but you understood. Right. We did. We knew soft wasn't really soft. <laughs> um, here's a question for everybody, so I don't know exactly who wants to take it. Disruption is not incremental. Yet what would be three practical and politically feasible steps that can and should be taken in 2019, so the questioner has given us six months to figure out a solution, to start breaking the incarceration cycle in your country? So Italy, Greece, U.S., what three tangible steps can be taken as of next year to break the cycle of incarceration in our countries? Well, you I would just start? like to say from my perspective as a Puerto Rican growing up in the South Bronx that there are no preventative measures. We are reactive to crime. Uh, there are generate, crime-generated factors that we ignore and when you have affluence and poverty existing side by side, they, it is going to erupt at one time or another. And so until we truly recognize that our country needs to reevaluate how it looks at these communities, these impoverished communities, these ignored communities, um, that this is going to happen. So three steps. Three, three things steps. that could First start one in the South, would be South Bronx. Acknowledging January. the conditions of these communities. That is your first step. Two. Be begin an honest and realistic dialogue about how to tackle those steps. Three. And three will be begin acting upon it, no matter how difficult or politically um, unacceptable it is at the time. Okay. Anybody else want to come up with three or one or two politically feasible, tangible steps to end the cycle of incarceration in your country? We see one step only, 
the disruption represented by children and the, the normality they carry uh, in uh, prison every day. Yeah, one thing. Uh, we have, a, in Italy, we have a new thing which is called MO, M O U, Memorandum of Understanding, called Charter for the Rights of Children with Imprisoned Parents. There, in the, is, 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 has been created by Bambini Senza Sbarre and signed by the Minister of Justice, the Ombudswoman, National Ombudswoman, and by LIA, okay? And he is ruling, uh, has been ruling for four years, and then the, it will be renewed then. Uh, there, there are the steps you are looking for. Just very precise. You should do this, this, and this. And what Leah is saying, all these steps are introducing the most disrupting thing inside the prison, which is normality. And the carrier of this normality are, again, children, because when you have children running in the corridors in the prison and making exactly what they do at home in the prison, we let them do, the MOU let them do, you are disrupting the, disrupting the whole thing. <laughs> Thank you. Would you like to take a Fontini or if, uh, any I, of the if Americans? If we don't taint the, the, the way we think, can you put your mic we up? cannot uh, taint, uh, we cannot... Um, make this, um, the, the, this change. It, it is a matter of, uh, of thinking, I believe. If we, maybe more education, maybe uh, change, uh, by changing the stereotypes, we can change the, uh, we can make this change in this uh, system that is very close and very close institutions and uh, uh, very close minds. Uh, inside prisons and outside prisons. Changing minds, changing, changing will. Minds. So we're almost out of time to end on a positive, upbeat note. Here's um, a great last question. In the Netherlands, they close prisons because they don't have enough prisoners. Please comment. Anybody want to take yeah. that one? We build, we build prisons to fill them with people in the United States. Yep. Right, in terms of in incremental steps, things we could do, we could have everyone divest from the prison industrial complex, right? So uh, I would say, you know, we, we seek to fill people. There are contracts where jurisdictions have to pay more if they don't fill the beds there. So. Anybody else want to comment oh, on having yeah, prisons and no prisoners? We don't uh, need prisons, but we need prisons because we feel safe. If there are prisons, <laughs> then uh, we are the others, we feel safe. So <laughs> this is the reason for the prisons, maybe. And uh, after 15 years uh, of my work in uh, prison, I can say that uh, we, we must shut the prison. It's not useful. Okay. I think when we think... Stronger. So shut them in Italy. I, I know it's Max, you've got the last word. You know, in the early, late 1960s, early 1970s, it was a working presumption uh, among decision makers in the United States that prisons would be abolished, or nearly so, uh, in America shortly. And obviously that became radically untrue. But when we talk about disrupting this system on a global scale, I think the most important lesson, and no one in the political spectrum in the United States would disagree with this, the most important thing that countries like Italy or Greece can do is not follow the lead of the United States. Bravo. England has, Canada has. <laughs> absolutely. So no, absolutely. The leadership should go from Europe to the United States, not vice versa. Not vice versa. versa. Good point. And Eduardo, Leah, do you want to say something, even though I said Max had the last word? Anybody want to say anything? Anthony, Erica, Potini, Peter? I want to thank the Stavros Niarchos Foundation for bringing us here and for allowing us to have this conversation. It is difficult, um, nuanced, so thank you very much.
Thank you very much. And now I would like to call on stage our next panel, Disrupting Inequality Through Education. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for being here with us this afternoon. I know we stand between you and lunch, but I promise we have a, a terrific panel gathered here this afternoon. So yesterday, Darren Walker and Nicholas Christakis and Ruth Faden began an excellent conversation about inequality, broadly speaking. And we have an opportunity to go into some greater details specifically about education and things that we can be doing to diminish inequality specifically in that realm. So because we are running a bit behind, uh, we, will, we will just jump right in. Um, if, if the three of you would like to begin with an overview of the work that each of your organizations is doing to be disruptors in the education space, and we'll begin with you, Alan. Thank you. There's a real challenge to education being a disruptor because educational institutions are premised on inequality. We're selective. We measure ourselves by how selective we are. And so we have to work to try to create a different paradigm. At IIE, what we focus on is widening access, reaching people who wouldn't normally think of going to university, and also working with the displaced students and uh, refugee students and displaced students around the world to connect them back to education. Heather? So I thought I'd talk a little bit about uh, something that goes beyond access, which is incredibly important, but I think only part of the story if you really want universities to disrupt inequality. And in some ways, you know, this, this conference has been about disruption, but there's enormous continuity among the panels from the very first day uh, with the Johns Hopkins panel talking about universities having values to the performance of Martin Luther King's speech uh, to what Darren Walker said that he can't, you won't be able to microfinance your way out of a structural inequality problem. And I think all of that brings us today to think creatively about how to turn private institutions into public resources. So part of it, the story has to be about access, but part of it really has to be about turning universities into standing armies for service. Universities always talk about service, but it turns out they think about it in too small a way often. And so I thought I'd talk a, just a moment about the Yale model, the Yale Law School model of service and what it looks like. And I'll just begin with a small story. Uh, for those of you who are in the United States, you probably paid a lot of attention to the litigation protecting dreamers. Dreamers are the kids who came to the United States when they were one, two, three years old, brought by their parents, lived a full life of a citizen, but don't have citizenship and are thus constantly at risk in our country. President Obama basically made it possible to, for them to be protected from deportation. President Trump withdrew that order. We filed a lawsuit at Yale Law School, and by we, I mean our students. So you might have noticed if you saw the pictures in the newspaper that the lawyers in Brooklyn looked really young. That's because they were second and third year law students. Second and third year law students doing the arguments, doing the press, doing the strategy work. That's called a clinic 
at Yale Law School. And that model is a completely different model about how universities can disrupt inequality. It's one that is student-centered. It's one that has students doing work of a scope and ambition that is simply unknown in any other place. This is not a system where it's a small little thing that you do and ch check off the box that says you've done some service. This is a program that has won three nationwide injunctions against the federal government, each of them protecting a different vulnerable group. And I'll just say, there is no nonprofit in the United States, to my knowledge, that has won three nationwide injunctions, not the gigantic ACLU, not any of these other extraordinarily well-resourced organizations, but a handful, a handful of students and a number of faculty members that you can count on one hand have nonetheless put together in such a creative fashion lawsuits that have been able to bring a greater equality into the United States than you can imagine. That is the kind of ambitious model that we ought to look to for all universities and all students. It's a chance for students to learn the values of citizenship in a hands-on way all the while learning to do good as part of their time at a university. So universities have all kinds of resources that ought to be out there helping the public. And you can't just ask those resources to be deployed as extracurriculars. They have to be embedded into our teaching and research process, and that's, that's the model that we're creating. And I, I think, Heather, what you said about teaching values of, of citizenship is the perfect segue for Jeff and their work. Thank you so much. Well, the National Constitution Center is very much uh, committed to promoting citizenship. And we have a radical and urgent mission in these polarized times, and that is to promote awareness and understanding of the US Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. These are perilous times for the future of democracy. And Yasha Monk's work has shown that young people are more willing to support autocratic alternatives to democracy than the older generation. But there is a direct correlation between civic education and commitment to democracy. Education enough is not uh, enough to do the trick. Highly educated people are likely to be more polarized than those who are less highly educated. On the other hand, those who are educated in the fundamentals of government in things like separation of powers, the importance of an independent judiciary, and the values of liberal democracy shared by Athens and the United States are more likely to support those values. So that's why the Constitution Center's mission is so important. And we pursue it by being the only institution in America that brings together liberals and conservatives to debate and educate people of all ages about every clause of the US Constitution. The centerpiece of our efforts is this exciting new online platform. I want you all to download it. Not now, because we're talking, but after the conference. It is called the Interactive Constitution. You can find it in the App Store and online. And it brings together the top liberal and conservative scholars in America to debate every clause of the Constitution, describing what they agree about and what they disagree about. So, for example, you can click on the most controversial parts of the Constitution, like our Second Amendment, which protects the right to bear arms. And you'll find the top liberal and conservative scholars, nominated by America's leading liberal and conservative organizations, with a thousand-word statement about what they agree the Second Amendment means, and then separate thousand-word statements about what they disagree. Isn't that an inspiring example of civic dialogue? And it is so nonpartisan and so galvanizing that it's being cited by liberals and conservatives, including just this morning in the Washington Post, Post George Will, the conservative colonist, linked to the interactive constitution in describing the powers of Congress. So this model of bringing together liberals and conservatives is one that we're pursuing on all media platforms. We have debates that travel across America and increasingly around the world to debate issues not in political but in constitutional terms. We have podcasts and videos. And this mostly 
and most importantly, as a curriculum that is being brought to school kids from middle school to high school and beyond. Our college board, which is the organization that sponsors advanced placement exams for highly performing high school kids, is adopting this interactive constitution as the centerpiece of its new curriculum. So with the help of Supreme Court Justices Elena Kagan and Neil Gorsuch, liberals and conservatives who support this project, the College Board will create a new curriculum for AP kids throughout America. What we need to do now, and that's why this topic of educational inequality is so urgently important, is to bring the same education to students of all backgrounds and abilities and economic opportunities. And we need to create partnerships with charter schools, public schools, and schools around the world so that this model of nonpartisan constitutional civic education can be distributed across the world. It's so exciting that this platform has received 17 million hits since it launched just two years ago. That's how hungry people are for this sort of trusted nonpartisan information. And now, in the next step, it is urgently important to bring this necessary model to students of all background across America and around the world. Thanks, Jeff. So you talk about um, civic education as being uh, part of the underpinnings of sustaining successful liberal democracy, but from an American perspective. Alan, if you could help set the stage for um, inequality worldwide in education right now and, and what, what you're seeing. So it's really important to take a global perspective. Uh, uh, and some of the real disruptors that uh, change the picture of inequality are, first of all, foundations, uh, like the Nyarcos Foundation, also Ford Foundation. We did an experiment with them uh, for 10 years to find people who would be, in 22 different countries, historically denied graduate education because of their disability, or their gender, or where they were born, or their religion, or the particular tribe or sect they came from. Uh, what we discovered is in their distressed economic circumstances, the very poor of these societies actually wanted to go to university and graduate school. Uh, we had 108,000 applications. We were able to fund nearly 5,000. 99% graduated, 98% went back to their home countries to promote social justice. Uh, and what universities found in the process is they were among the best students they admitted. Uh, uh, one of the first that was admitted was at the Yale School of Forestry, a young woman from Vietnam who had polio. She's now the deputy minister of forestry in Vietnam. Would have never had a chance to go to school without this. But universities globally have to be intentional to find not the few who are really qualified, but the many who are very poor that may be even more qualified or do more with the opportunity. So one disruptor is the foundation intervening in universities to say, let's not only widen access, but let's widen who we look for and where we look for them. The second problem is we have to deal, and it's new for us, with refugees and displaced students. Higher ed has never had to deal with any significant number of refugee students or displaced students until uh, we discovered the Syrians as a result of the civil war in Syria. Probably 250,000 Syrians today disconnected from higher ed. But when you connect them, they thrive. And so we don't have to discover a quantum computer to have wonderful effects. The effects are already here if we can get them into university, but the disruption is how do you take refugee students into a system that's nationally focused? And on that topic of refugees, do you have any optimism for how higher education can successfully integrate the large number of refugees we have right now? Because I hear what you're saying that they need to be, but, but how will that happen? Or how can it happen? There are about 25,000 institutions of higher education qualified around the world to take international students. We don't think of refugees as international students. Change the paradigm. Everyone takes one, because what we're learning is one refugee student reconnected to education not only thrives, but affects 10 others. 
because they're mentoring the coming generation, their families believe that at least one person has been helped. And if everyone took one, and every one that was taken affected 10 people, we would have gone from 25,000 students accepted in reconnected to their university, but to affecting maybe a quarter of a million people that are part of the diaspora that are really disaffected and, and have no hope. And at the end of the day, giving one person hope can be very highly magnified, but it takes political will of universities and countries to say, yes, refugees are people that need to be educated and they need higher education and the world has never faced that before and higher ed has never faced that before. Had a lot of refugees before but they weren't university students. We had a lot of displaced people but they weren't university students. Well this time it's different and this time we have to step up and it could be a real disruptor to how we think of our institutions if everyone just took one. Are there any institutions that you've seen that are, are leaders in this conversation? We're currently working with 400 universities around the world that have said we will take one, some will take 10. Uh, they're public, they're private. Uh, there's a very a terrific uh, project here in the Athens Community School that's taking high school students that are refugees, bringing them into the community school so that they can eventually also go on to university. So I think universities know how to do this. It's really generating the political will to say we are going to do it because if we don't, this will be the world's lost generation. And Heather, to shift to you, obviously, uh, you're a practitioner and in thinking about, um, you, you spoke about the impact that your students have once they receive a wonderful Yale Law education, but in terms of accessibility to the university in the first place, uh, how do you think through those issues? So accessibility is incredibly important. We've been working very hard on it. Uh, so two and a half years ago, I co-chaired a committee looking at diversity writ large at the law school, including our admissions process. And we made just some, some basic changes into the admissions process that had a dramatic result. So let me give you two examples of them. First, we, like most of our peers, had roughly 32% students of color over the last 10 years. In two years, we went from that number to having 48% students of color in the current first year, rising second year class. So how did we do that? One of the things that we realized was that students of color are less likely to apply to us because we are the most prestigious law school in the country and the hardest one to get into. And so what we were discovering is even students who had gotten into Harvard Law School or Stanford Law School were not applying to us. So what we did was very, very simple. We had our own students call these high achieving students of color and say, you know, I was in your shoes you can get in. They even would send them a sample essay. And the sample essays were great because they were essays that got someone in and sometimes the students would say, oh, you know what, I could do better than that. And they'd send in that application. So that caused a dramatic rise in the number of students applying, students of color applying, thus diversifying our pool. The second thing we did is we just did a better job of recruiting. So we started to allocate more time and resources to talking to those students about their particular concerns. And again, you know, we have an extraordinarily high yield. We're the envy of every law school in the United States. But, but now, these students of color are coming to the law school at a higher rate than even the, the, the students who are not, um, who are not uh, black, brown, or or um, you know, black, Latino, or, or Asian. So that has been on both sides, you know, both on the input side and the output side, we've just dramatically changed the class. What does it mean in real terms? It means that when you walk into a classroom and you're teaching about a question of race that's complicated, you are not going to have only one black or Latino face in that room. That is, there are going to be more students there with a much more diverse range of experiences talking about those issues, which is to everyone's benefit. The other group we really focused on were people who had either had family members who had never gone to college or people who had never gone to professional school. So we call them first geners because they're the first in their whole generation to go to college or to go to professional school. And again, what we were finding was 
these students uh, were one, less likely to apply, and two, worried about talking about the fact that they were the first person in their family to go to college. They were ashamed of the fact that they were the first person in their family to go to college. And so what we did is something very, very simple. In the old days, we used to say to, us, to them, tell us about your parents. We had, when was, what was the last uh, school that they went to? And students would just leave it blank because they did not want to say, actually, my dad never made it past high school. They were just embarrassed about it. So instead, we affirmatively invited them and told them, we want to celebrate not just how far you've gone, but how far you've come to get here. And it had a dramatic effect, I'll just tell you, in reading applications. Our faculty reads all the applications. And when you read a story about a student who had no running water when he grew up, and he nonetheless made it to a point where he is competitive for one of the greatest law schools in the world, that is nothing short of inspiring. So we now have a class that is 20% first in the family to go to a professional school of any sort, 10% first in the family to go to college. Those are numbers we think we've never had before and we're really, really pleased because, and all of us did, these are small changes that had dramatic effects on our class. Could you speak a little bit about how you support these students once, once they get to campus? Yeah, so, so one of the th mistakes I think that schools make when they bring in a more diverse class is they think you can just give these students a manual and they'll figure out how to go where they're going. So just you know, imagine you're a student who doesn't even know what a law school exam looks like. You may be a student who doesn't have any lawyers. You may not even know a lawyer and you're suddenly put in this world where some of the students in your class come from generations of lawyers, from people whose family founded law firms. They come from private schools with, with excellent educations. The world for those students seems natural. And they also come with networks. So these are students who know classmates, who know family members, who know friends of their family, who can help them get jobs, help them think through the many paths before them, help them make all sorts of career decisions. So networks are a problem if you are interested in promoting equality inside your, your school. And the solution that most schools take to the problem of networks is just to give them a manual, say, well, if it's on the website, you can read about it and understand it. That is never the answer to the problem of networks. So what we are doing is building our students a better network. We are relying upon our alumni and our students and our faculty to provide the same kind of advice, the same career support, the same ability to make a phone call that those, the other students come with automatically. So in my view, the solution to the problem of networks is to build your students better networks. <clears throat> and Jeff, um, obviously accessibility, uh, the courts have played a significant role in determining the legislative landscape around what is allowed um, in terms of admissions policies, both at the collegiate level um, and younger as well. Could you walk us through uh, the current state of um, legal precedent for affirmative action? The current state of legal precedent for affirmative action is unsettled. Uh, and much of it hangs on the vote of a single justice, Justice Anthony Kennedy, who has given signs that he may retire sooner rather than later. So the landscape may change even more dramatically. But broadly, uh, just a few years ago, Justice Kennedy wrote a decision affirming the constitutionality of affirmative action in higher education as long as it was designed to promote the benefits of intellectual diversity. He both invoked the First Amendment's rights of free expression and also the 14th Amendment's protections of equality under law. And he emphasized that creating role models that increase the legitimacy of institutions like Yale and Harvard and the Army and the University of Texas is a compelling interest under the Constitution, and therefore Texas's programs, which both admitted the top 10% of all kids who graduated from high school in Texas, and then added an additional affirmative action program to increase diversity, was consistent with the Constitution. That decision produced fiery dissents from four justices, the more conservative justices, who insisted essentially that the Constitution is colorblind 
and that any racial classifications, even those to, designed to promote diversity, are inherently suspect, and only uh, race-conscious actions designed to compensate individual victims for past discrimination can be permissible. Uh, and Justice Clarence Thomas, a, a, a Yale alum like many members of the Supreme Court, was especially passionate in denouncing the effects of affirmative action on its beneficiaries and talked about the faddish views of the cognoscente who in the eyes, in the aim of helping minorities actually harm them. There is an extremely important case that is now coming up in the lower courts. It's a suit against Harvard University and it accuses Harvard of having artificially uh, lowered the number of Asian American students who were admitted uh, in an effort to admit other minorities. Uh, the numbers are being demanded from Harvard. Uh, they may eventually become public at trial. And it's possible that this suit, which is still in its early stages, if it bubbles up to the Supreme Court, might provide uh, an especially sympathetic case either for Justice Kennedy to change his mind because he's been waffling on this issue or if he's retired for the court to dramatically restrict the amount of affirmative action that's permitted in America. It's been a great constitutional drama as Heather can describe far better than, than I can over the past uh, decade or more as the court is poised between five justices who are admitted, who are willing to allow affirmative action to create intellectual diversity, and four who are ardently opposed to it with, with Justice Kennedy in the middle, and this Harvard case may provide an opportunity for a shift to occur. Heather, would you like to weigh in? Sure, I mean, it, it, law schools are in a slightly different place because Asian Americans are actually underrepresented uh, in, in law school applicant pools and in law school, um, in post-law school work. But I'll just say, just to add uh, to, to uh, the excellent description about how the court works, here's the mistake that the Supreme Court made that has handicapped all of us in, ability, in using our education, our educational institutions to disrupt inequality, and it's very simple. The Supreme Court said, you are allowed to take race into account if you want to create intellectual diversity. You want a, a bunch of people with different experiences sitting inside the classroom. Intellectual diversity is incredibly important. It is the lifeblood of any university. But what the Supreme Court also prevented us from doing is to consider the fact that a student who is black or Latino has probably experienced discrimination that has not been experienced by white students who apply. What that means is that it makes it much harder for us to ask of those students this question that we always ask of our first genders nowadays, which is how far did you come? We can't take into account how far a student came. And I'll just tell you, you know, when I read the, the applications of the first genders, I think to myself, wow, this student came exactly as far as another student, except she did not have the benefit of a prep school education or extremely wealthy family or LSAT tutors or someone to help her write her essay. She just got there on her own brain power and energy and grit. That is also true of people who come from historically discriminated against groups. They are battling a larger obstacle. And what the Supreme Court has systematically prevented us from doing when we ask for these applications is to think about that question. That's the mistake that the Supreme Court made. And one vote at this moment could change it. But for now, it's, it's a real handicap in the ability of universities, at least in the United States, to disrupt inequality. We've had a number of questions coming in. I'd like to, to turn to some of them. Um, so far, the, the conversation has been exclusively on higher education. How much how much of change can take place within higher education versus much earlier? I don't know who would like to begin, Alan. You take that one. So one of the things we're discovering in refugee camps and with displaced persons is that they're not only university students, but high school students. And I think the project here at the American, at the uh, Athens Community School shows what existing high schools can do if they take on the burden of and the duty. and the moral responsibility of saying, how do we help students in high school who are in our midst uh, come back to school? Uh, so that's one model. Another model is to provide secondary education in refugee camps, and increasingly people live in those camps 15, 16, 17 years. 
And so we're going to have to discover, to continue to experiment not only with universities and refugee camps and distance learning, but high schools which enabled them to then go to universities. And then, of course, the question is, if they can go to university, where do they go if they're not citizens of the country where the camp is? So I think education is a much broader challenge today. Uh, and we can't entirely depend on the foundations. We can't entirely depend on the government. We can't entirely depend on teaching programs. It takes all of civil society to say uh, these 69 million people who are refugees or displaced are, belong to all of us, and their education is responsibility of all of us. And that complicates uh, university and high schools and other types of educational institutions. The, the other thing we have to do is figure out what we're going to do when the jobs that exist today disappear tomorrow. What are we educating for? And maybe we ought to think about the kind of education that, that enable not only refugees, but our own citizens to have jobs in the future that don't exist today, because educating them for the jobs that exist today, if half of them go away in 25 years, uh, is going to be a great disruption. Can I just, I just add to that? I, I also think that uh, education at the K through 12 level suffers in some ways from the same problem that university educations often suffer from, which is that they are too inwardly focused and they focus only on learning by watching uh, and not learning by doing. And to my mind, just to bring you inside for a moment in what I mean by learning by doing, let me just tell you a small story about our clinic for veterans. So we have a clinic for veterans, half of that clinic are veterans of, of the Afghanistan and Iraq wars, and of the other half are really progressive left-wing students who are all interested in doing the same work. So a few years ago, these students started to do the work and they noticed something strange. They noticed that veterans could not bring what are called class actions, which is a really powerful litigation tool that lets you bring a whole bunch of people into the courtroom at the same time to pursue the same claim. And they started to ask around to all the veterans lawyers community and said, well, why is it that veterans can't bring class actions? And what they were told was, well, that's how it has always been. Now, what I love about our students is that if you want to really tick off a Yale Law student, you answer the question, that's how it's always been. So the students decided to sue. And they made it possible for the first time in our country's history for veterans to bring class actions. They actually they made a tell to the John Stewart show, if you watch The Daily Show, um, they because they did all the press for it. And they've now brought four class actions, including one on behalf of naval veterans who have PTSD and were, were, were not honorably discharged as a result. Now, so why is that example important? That example is important because those students were using all the knowledge that we imparted to them in a traditional classroom, but they were learning other things. They were learning to solve problems. They were learning to think critically about everything, to question everything. That's a central tool of citizenship. They were learning to work across party lines. In order to get that lawsuit forward and get the support they needed for it, they needed to appeal to people who had very different views than their own. In other words, they were cementing the lessons of citizenship by doing something. And all the while, they were learning to serve other people. If you want to pay attention to what Darren Walker said yesterday, where he said there's a difference between generosity in philanthropy and justice in philanthropy. If you want to orient a generation around justice, rather than generosity, that's the kind of experience that they ought to have. And while well, you, know, you have to adapt it to the context, uh, although my daughter, I think, is a lawyer at heart, she's in high school and can't sue anyone yet, although she's eager to do so. But if you want to adapt it, you need to think about students not just learning in the traditional way that they learn, but learning by doing, by developing the skill sets of citizenship from the beginning onward. Because Jeff is exactly right, learning to work with people who disagree does not come from sitting in a classroom and watching someone speak to you. Learning to do the basic tools of citizenship have to start early, 
and they have to involve working in teams, which is what we do for the rest of our lives. But for some reason, we don't do a very good job in high school, we don't do a very good job in college, and we don't do a very good job in graduate school of teaching people those skills. So we should imagine every school trying to create essentially laboratories of democracy where you learn by doing, not just learn by watching. And this notion that Heather talks about so powerfully of creating laboratories of democracy, Justice Louis Brandeis's phrase, for K through 12 students is also necessary to create for college students and for learners of all ages because the future of democracy depends on it. We are here in Athens, the cradle of democracy. And it is necessary to remind ourselves that the American framers, when they created the US Constitution, look to Athens, both as an inspiration for the height of civilization in the fifth century, and also as a cautionary tale about the dangers of a lack of civic education. In Federalist 55, Madison said, in all large assemblies of any number constituted, passion never fails to wrest the scepter from reason. Even if every Athenian had been Socrates, Athens would still have been a mob. Athens uh, was uh, the model for Madison because he and Hamilton read Socrates and Aristotle about the dangers of direct democracy. They feared demagogues like Cleon who had misled the assembly into an ill-considered invasion. And therefore they tried to create not a direct democracy like Athens, but a representative republic where passion would be cooled and majorities could form their opinions slowly and deliberately over time. And the entire American system was premised on the idea that there would be time enough to deliberate, as Justice Brandeis said, and that people would be able to inform themselves with facts and knowledge. Madison, in applauding a system of general education in Kentucky, said, popular government without the means of acquiring popular information is a prelude to tragedy or farce, but he was confident that knowledge would triumph over ignorance as long as knowledge was broadly diffused. And John Adams, in again criticizing the Athenian system, said that it was more important that knowledge be broadly diffused among what he called the poor rather than the rich. So the founders were centrally concerned with this question of educational inequality. Friends, now that deliberation has become so much broadly more dispersed and that new media technologies like Facebook and Twitter as we heard about both yesterday and at the superb Agora conference uh, a few days ago, now that these de technologies are making possible decisions in warp speed through Brexit votes and Twitter polls, all of the benefits of the extended republic that the American founders counted on to slow down deliberation, to allow citizens to acquire information slowly and thoughtfully, and to form opinions based on reason rather than passion, all of these are under siege. And that's why it's more urgently important than ever that citizens of all ages, not just crucially important middle school and high school and college students, but also citizens, Adult citizens continue to engage in lifelong learning and to educate themselves through life. Louis Brandeis was so excited to learn that the Greek word for leisure was unemployment. A scholai, a lack of employment. He thought what a happy land, Greece, 5th century Greece, in which citizens could spend their moments of unemployment by cultivating their faculties of reason, by learning and preparing themselves for citizenship. He defended the Athenians against Madison's charge that Athens was ill-informed and was struck, as future scholarship has confirmed, by the fact that in Athens, knowledge was broadly dispersed and people with different skill sets could convene together to deliberate in the public good, and recent evidence suggests that 5th century Athens was more effective than Sparta in the dispersion of education and also in economic achievements, because democracy works, and it's important, but it has to be informed. So this is why our topic today of educational inequality turns on access to Civic education. Civic education is not just something that uh, middle school kids or high school kids should learn and then turn behind. 
without acquiring the capacity of civil deliberation, without being able to listen respectfully to different points of view, without being able to get out of our filter bubbles and echo chambers, we, by which I mean the privileged, the advantaged, the highly educated, are just as likely to become polarized, passionate, mob-like uh, uh, citizens as those who are less fortunate. So that is why the mission of the Constitution Center, like Yale Law School, where I developed my passion for constitutional education, are such crucial institutions in forming the habits of citizenship. And that is why, if we care about the problem of educational inequality, which we must care about because, as the founders recognized, democracy will falter without it. We cannot save democracy without making civic education accessible and available to citizens of all ages and backgrounds. That is the task. And it is so meaningful, I have to end this uh, uh, passionate appeal to the assembly here by saying it's so meaningful to do it in Athens. And it has been so inspiring for me to visit the Acropolis and the, and the uh, Parthenon and the Agora and to see the places where these great citizens, both the uh, Assembly of 500 and also the, the Democratic Assembly, form the habits that were based on the premise that citizens can develop their faculties of reason, they can acquire information, and together they can engage in taming their passions to be governed by reason. Thanks, Jeff. Um, actually, I wanted to push back a little bit and ask, so obviously you've made a, a very compelling uh, pitch for why civic education is important. Do you think that civic education um, within the population is actually less than it has been in the past, or are we just seeing its effects more because of the increased communication that you were talking about with, with representatives? Civic education is under siege. The head of the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, Stephen Heinz, recently noted that 1% of philanthropic giving goes to civic education. That is a scandal and a shame. And it used to be more. A generation ago, the great foundations were centrally committed to this enterprise. Now they are not. Nor are our schools. Civic education, like everything else in this polarized society, has become politicized. And teachers are so afraid of teaching an issue like the Second Amendment or gun rights because they're afraid that it will inflame one side or the other. As a result, it is not being taught. There is a mild civic education requirement in our so-called common core, which many public schools follow, although they're not allowed to use the name. But in practice, uh, civic education has been watered down into a sort of amorphous exhortation to participate in politics without substantive knowledge in history, in the Constitution, in the stories of the Greeks, in the stories of the founders. Uh, it was taught uh, generations ago. Uh, Hillary Clinton, as it happens, has talked about how much her civic classes and the historic pageants in Chicago public schools shaped her commitment to public service, but it's not now. And the statistics are bleak. I'm sure you've heard about them. According to the most recent uh, Annenberg poll, only a third of Americans can name all three branches of government, and a third cannot name a single branch. The idea of the necessity of having three branches of government came from Athens, and that stark, painful statistic is a sign of the crisis we're in. Furthermore, the effects are being felt when it comes to the attachment to liberty. Remember, the purpose of educating people about liberty is so they will demand it and defend it. And a majority of college kids on campus say that it's okay to shout down speakers with whom you disagree a position that the Supreme Court has unanimously rejected. In a nonpartisan way, I can say unhesitatingly that that view is not consistent with the First Amendment as interpreted by liberal and conservative justices and for which we fought a revolution, but a majority of college kids believe it. So we have an urgent problem which is right before our eyes. No one here can pretend to be surprised when we find statistics of lack of civic knowledge because the polls are right out there. We know its causes, the politicization of uh, the schools and the lack of philanthropic funding, and we have solution models of the kind that we're 
talking about here, whereby bringing together people of different perspectives to debate not politics, but the historic uh, roots and uh, principles of the Constitution, uh, people will both be enlightened and uh, teachers can teach this without fear of political bias. And that is why all of the work that we're doing here is so urgently important. Do either of you want to chime in here? If I could just think back to yesterday a minute and Mike's presentation uh, about quantum computing uh, and all the benefits that will come when we discover a quantum computer. Uh, the neat thing about what the three of us are talking about is we've already discovered the quantum computer. It is education. Uh, we've perfected it over the course of 3,000 years. It exists everywhere. What doesn't exist everywhere is access. What doesn't exist everywhere is equality. But we don't have to invent the cure for whether it's civic education or the education of first generation or everybody in between. We, we have it. The, the question is how do we make it accessible not just to the few that are wealthy and qualified but to the many who need the education to move our societies forward, whether it's America or elsewhere. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts on how we go about doing that. How much do you think um, must happen at the, at the policy level? And, and what do you think would be the most important policy steps to take towards increasing access? Or is it in another realm? We definitely need funding, funding, funding. Um, ac educations are expensive when they're done right, and so you need to, to provide funding and, and in a broad-based way. So I think there's so much concentration right now on a small number of private universities, but you need to think about community colleges and all the kinds of resources that are available. Uh, the other thing I think that you, you should not have to th always look to the government to do something. And I'll just say, at least in the United States, I don't, uh, at this moment, I don't think we're going to get a lot of action out of the federal government. But, but private and public institutions can lead the way on this by rethinking what they're doing themselves. The, the core, to my mind, of civic education, there's two pieces to it. So one is the piece that Jeff was just so eloquently talking about, which is just knowing how the system works and why it matters. And the second piece of it, and this goes a little bit to the question of, of why people are so polarized, is being able to check your own biases and be able to question your own convictions as well as others. So on Wednesday, uh, when we were talking about the Agora, we talked about the way that in law schools, from the very first day you walk into a classroom, you are forced to make the very best argument for the other side. And, and not just to make a good argument in a kind of foolish way. You have to imaginatively and sympathetically reconstruct the best argument for the other side. And as I said on Wednesday, that is a humbling exercise. Because if you are forced to figure out what's honorable in your opponent's views and what's wrong about your own, or at least the weaknesses in your own arguments, you are not going to do the thing that we've been so worried about, which is engage in mob thinking. You're not just going to automatically accept whatever your side gives you. You're going to question yourself, you're going to question your side, and you're going to respect the other side. But that's an essential part of education. That's how law schools teach you from the first day you walk into the classroom, and that needs to be the model in thinking about civic education as well. It's both about having the basic knowledge and then about knowing how to think critically, not just about the world around you, but what's inside your own head. You say that so powerfully, Heather, and you remind us that civic education never ends, that as adults, we have an obligation to discuss the news with our fellow citizen, respectfully listening to different points of view and assimilating it. I think you're also absolutely right that the habits that we learned at law school of uh, understanding that there are good arguments on both sides of most hotly contested constitutional questions, that the Constitution, as Justice Holmes said, is made for people of fundamentally differing points of view, and that it's helpful to separate your political from your constitutional views. That's a distinction that's familiar to us as constitutional lawyers, but we need to introduce it to citizens around the world. In other words, you might believe that gun control is a really good idea, but the Constitution prohibits it, or you might think that gun control is a terrible idea, but the Constitution allows it. And that ability to recognize that you're not concerned not with what you personally think the government should do, but what our fundamental charters of government have said that the government may do is an exercise in intellectual humility, 
and in empathy, and it allows citizens to converge around a common set of principles, even though they may disagree about the application in particular cases. I'm, I, I learned this uh, from my great teachers in law school, and I'm on a mission to teach this method of constitutional thinking to students and citizens of all ages, because the very process of separating politics from the Constitution allows the kind of civil dialogue and respectful listening that democracy requires. And I also must uh, echo Heather's uh, observation that funding is crucial and it will have to come from private sources. The National Constitution Center is this gorgeous institution. It's a palace of the Constitution on Independence Mall designed by I.M. Pei right across from Independence Hall. It was created by the U.S. Congress during the bicentennial of the Constitution, but it was created as a private nonprofit without any further governmental funding. So uh, Congress basically said, go educate America about the Constitution, but you're going to have to raise your own money to do it. And as Heather says, the nature of uh, funding in America right now is it's very unlikely that the U.S. government is going to fund uh, civic education in any kind of sustained way. So that is, and so that's the bottom line is that only philanthropy can guarantee the future of democracy. That is what I truly believe. If you are convinced by all three of us that civic education is necessary for the future of democracy, then you will have to conclude that philanthropists have an opportunity and indeed an obligation to make that possible so that citizens can truly govern themselves. So I think you all have both made uh, very compelling cases for why civics education is an enduring need. But I, th I would like to go back to the point that Alan brought up about the changing job landscape and the impact that has on inequality. So we have certain constants within education that we either need to keep as they are or improve, but what are the, th what, where are the areas that you think we're significantly going to need to change to adjust for the future? So we have in all of our universities a core curriculum, whether it's uh, professionally driven or whether it's driven by the liberal arts. And it was invented here at Plato's Academy. The, the question is, will it serve the next 50 years for a time when we don't know what the jobs will be, but they're not the jobs that are here now? So universities need to, uh, at every country at, at all levels, public and private, to say, what is the future toward which we're educating? Who are we educating for that future? And how do we give them access? And there is a, uh, a lot we can still learn from Greece. Uh, there is a goddess of disruption. Uh, she has two natures, Hesiod reminds us. One is to encourage people to battle and to war. And the other is to make even the shiftless toil and make men, and that time it was directed at men, eager to work. And I think universities need to be eager to work on the next generation of jobs, the next generation of the future. And that will probably change the curricula. It, we're already changing the way you teach in law school. We're already thinking about how do you introduce civics education as lifelong learning. Uh, we, we will face the challenge of new curricula new ways of teaching, and, and maybe a lot more, as Heather said, teaching by doing. Right now, there's a constant pressure, at least in the United States, everyone feels like they need to go to uh, college, typically to a four-year institution, that that's something that's absolutely imperative in order to have um, good future prospects. Do you think that that prevailing narrative will change, or is that with us to stay? Me, I think it will change, and what we'll see is technology deliver much more readily to the workplace the skills and education people need, and so community colleges in America and around the world may actually grow in, in what, what, who they reach and how they reach it. Uh, and and I, th I think it, it will be important to, to, like laws and constitutions, value the treasures we have in higher education and secondary education systems to say, how can we make them better for the future? And I think the answer to that will mean we also make them different. We're, we're almost out of time. I'd like to end with a final question that I think um, we've touched on some, but if you each have short answers to, I'm curious to hear. Um, just in general, 
is education still the vehicle it's supposed to be for social mobility? I think education is not right now the, the vehicle for social mobility that perhaps it once was, um, precisely because in some ways there's been a lockup of many of these elite institutions by the elite. Uh, and which is exactly why you really need to push schools to think about the admi their admissions process, the diversity of their class, and then, again, what they do with it. Um, universities are force multipliers. They can either train a generation to sit back and listen, or they can train a generation to go out and do something. If we were to train a generation in the lessons of service in the way that Martin Luther King talked about it, Darren Walker talked about it, that would be transformational in a fashion that, that I think that is impossible to imagine right now. But, but right now, um, we're falling short. So Heather talked about what veterans do and how they make a difference. Uh, uh, refugees are also a force for change. Uh, and if we don't educate them, if we don't give them access, uh, we are going to have a lost generation. So I'd say their social mobility is as important as any of the citizens in our own countries, and countries that have capacity need to adopt the refugee communities that they have so that they don't propagate a lost generation in their own societies uh, living among us or around the world. As Heather said, education is not uh, enough of the engine for social mobility that it should be. But I want to close with the privilege of being able to by saying that social mobility is not the only goal of education. The other goal of education is to make better human beings and better citizens, and to have faith that people of all economic backgrounds have the ability and opportunity to cultivate their faculties of reason so that they can be as just self-governing as the citizens of ancient Athens from all backgrounds and all classes. I can't resist by ending. Uh, it's a party trick, but we're here in Athens, and this quotation from Louis Brandeis combines a quotation from Pericles' funeral oration with his overwhelming um, Jeffersonian faith in the ability of education to broadly uh, increase uh, social mobility as well as uh, civic knowledge. And here it is, this is Louis Brandeis in the Whitney in California case defending the reason that we have free speech. And he said that those who made our revolution believed that the final end of the state was to make men free to develop their faculties and that in its government, the deliberative forces should prevail over the arbitrary. They valued liberty both as an end and as a means. They believed liberty to be the secret of happiness and courage to be the secret of liberty. That's from Pericles' funeral oration as translated by Alfred Zimmern in his book, The Greek Commonwealth. They believe that freedom to think as you will and to speak as you think are means indispensable to the discovery and spread of political truth, that without free speech and assembly, discussion would be futile, that with them, discussion affords ordinarily adequate protection against the dissemination of noxious doctrine, that the greatest threat to freedom is an inert people, that public discussion is a political duty, and that this should be a fundamental principle of the American government. It's such a privilege to be able to recite those words here in Athens at this wonderful conference, and that is why we need civic education. Thank you, Jeff, for that wonderful wrap-up, and join me in thanking our panelists.